Hello, church. Welcome to Crossbridge Online. We're so glad that you've come today. If you're just joining us, we want to make sure you get connected with us. You can follow the link that we've provided on the screen and in the comments. Make sure you go there, check us out, and get plugged in. Thank you again for joining us. Let me start our worship with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we do this because of you. We come together because of you, and today we worship you. So we pray that today's worship would go forth into homes and cities, wherever people are watching, as we continue to gather as the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
seeing holy, 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 which is all day and all night. The elders that are seated before the throne of God, they bow down and they cast down their crowns and they say, oh Lord, our God, you alone are worthy of all glory and honor and praise. We thank you, Jesus. A seed of kindness grows inside of me And life re-spreads its wings over everything A beacon of light to brighten the universe And peace will make its home Eternally A hope For better days is here A river rolling down The barren land A joy For every trial I see journey through it all and love will find its way A seed of kindness grows inside of me and life has Over everything, a beacon of light to brighten the universe, and peace will make it home eternally. A hope for better days is here.
Church, I want to invite you into a time of giving. Giving is something that's very meaningful to us. We give every week and we do it together. Why? Because it reminds us that we are on mission together. As we give together, we are giving so that people will experience the hope of the gospel in their lives. We are giving so that the physical and emotional needs of people are met in our city and beyond. Uh, Earlier in the year, we announced to you officially that we have been partnering with our campus in Sao Paulo as we have adopted a favela in that city in order to open a resource center where we will have after-school programs there, where we will have courses being offered to the neighbors that live in that community so that they will be able to get a profession and earn a living out of that. Today, I want to show you an update of where things are at the Favela do Sapo in Sao Paulo in partnership with our campus there. Uh, You're going to hear from some members of our church there as well as Pastor Hobson. So watch this video. Hi, guys. I'm Isa, and I'm with the Presbyterian Church of Perdizes in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm here to say thank you all very much. It's because of your help and your generosity that we're able to provide this community, the Agua Branca community, a possibility of a better tomorrow. It gives me great joy to show you a little bit about this project right now. The Agua Branca community was founded in the 1970s. Today, almost 5,000 people live here, formed mostly by informal workers living on the edge of poverty. This community has always suffered since its foundation, and the pandemic has only worsened their condition. What breaks our hearts is to know that they are in the social gap. Developed alongside multi-billion dollar soccer clubs and the growing middle class, This community has become invisible and has suffered from prejudice, neglect, lack of jobs, lack of schools, and hunger. The simple symptoms of the city are evident every day in this place. Eu fui uma criança que eu era terrível. Depois de jovem e adolescente, aí me envolvi aí no mundo do crime. Cheguei até a ser gerente aí do tráfico aí, não fiquei uns dias preso também, não foi legal para mim, para minha família, achei melhor eu mudar um pouco de vida e graças a Deus, Deus me colocou no outro caminho, hoje eu tenho essa oportunidade de estar dentro da comunidade aí, sendo presidente da associação, todos nós temos a nossa missão na terra, eu acho que a minha parte eu tô tentando fazer, a minha missão era bagunçar, hoje é tentar organizar. O meu sonho é deixar uma comunidade organizada, uma comunidade unida, um espaço bacana para nossas crianças, não precisar ter que atravessar a avenida, atravessar a ponte para estudar e no projeto. Então a intenção é que seja tudo dentro da comunidade, para facilitar a vida dos pais, das mães e também das crianças também. When we first planted our church, we looked for a community within a two mile range so that we could help out. We planted our church in an upscale neighborhood, but we couldn't forget about the poor. God led us to this place. The choice became more evident when we learned about a little girl who drowned under a shack when the creek nearby overflowed. We put our efforts in motion, and by the grace of God, we were able to help her family get back on their feet and build a new place to live. We haven't left the community since then. It's a relationship that started three years ago, and these people have become our people. Our pastor became their pastor. Their struggles have become our struggles, and their hope has become our hope. 
We pray here, we preach on the street, we donate food, we take care of the children, we cry with them, and we dream their dreams. In addition to your contribution, and in order to keep this project going forward, God has blessed us with a significant partnership with the Residents Association and also the local government. See how God has brought these people together so that we could carry out this project. This project is important because the government can't walk without having the people on the side. And the people on the side are these associations, these groups, evangelic groups, political groups, that enter to sum up and take this project forward. Já estamos desenvolvendo esse projeto aí com vocês. Documentação, agregar local. Tem um terreno aqui no fundo que a gente, nós estamos buscando esse terreno para alocar esse, esse projeto. So as you saw, by joining our forts, the portal project starts here. The next steps is to buy two office containers and with them we will be able to offer entrepreneurship education and we will provide social services with help of doctors and lawyers. We will fight alongside the community for justice and equality. And by the end, not less important, our dream is to see one church growing here, one church multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-generational. And my hope, my hope is to see a public faith in action. So I want to say thank you, Crossbridge Church. Thank you for this opportunity. Love you guys. Love you. What an amazing work we get to participate in. Our hope is that in a few months, we will have a few containers there that will be converted into offices and classroom space where these things will continue to take place and fully materialize that vision. In the meantime, we are meeting the needs and building relationships with the community and its leaders. And you will hear as time goes on more and more updates on that. As you give today, you give, and some of your gifts go also to that project. So if you feel called to give today and to be a part of what God is doing through the life of Crossbridge in the city of Sao Paulo, I want to invite you to do so in three ways. If you're watching from YouTube or Facebook, there's a link in the chat box there that you can click on. It'll take you to a giving page. If you're watching from our website, there's a give button that you can click above the screen there, and it will take you to our giving page. Or if you choose to do so, you can mail a check to your campus as well. Uh, let me pray and thank God for the work that he's doing in Sao Paulo through our church and thank him ahead of time for all the resources that will be gathered today. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are grateful for your generosity. Uh, your generosity over our lives, Father, allows us to be generous to others. Uh, Father, and to see their needs met as well. Father, we pray that all the resources that will be gathered here today uh, would be stewarded wisely and the lives of people in our city and beyond would be changed by the power of the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey church, we have arrived at the season finale of our series, Love Works. And tonight we're going to be looking into the topic of creation, but not creation as in origins, but creation as in how are we to participate in God's creation? How are we to steward God's creation? I'm excited because I've never preached a sermon on this topic before. And I don't believe I've ever heard a sermon preached on this topic before, but I think you will see that it is important that we understand God's heart for his creation and the role that we play because we see clearly in Scripture that there is a mandate and a call for us to steward this creation that we get to enjoy rightly. And it's fitting that this topic and the close of this series comes on Memorial Day because I don't know for you, but for me, Memorial Day is one of those holiday weekends where I feel the urge to go outside. I feel the urge to go to the beach, to take a bike ride, to be outside and hopefully grill, have a party. I I just want to be outside on Memorial Day weekend, and, and maybe you feel the same. And so I pray that as you spend time tomorrow or you have this weekend, that this word that God has for you and for me that it would challenge you and it would encourage you and it would show you God's love for his creation and his call for you. And so that's the question that we're going to deal with tonight. How does love work in creation? Well, we very clearly see how God's love works in the creation of our physical world. It's not a mystery. The very beginning of the Bible reveals to us God's love working and him creating this physical universe that we enjoy. And it's very interesting when you go back to the very first chapter of the Bible in the book of Genesis, we read that God creates everything out of nothing, ex nihilo, the heavens and the earth, everything around us. And what's interesting is that God creates it step by step. So we could have just stopped right there and said, the creation, the physical world has value because God created it. So if God creates something, necessarily it has value. But God creates it also step by step. And when you read, it says, after each day, he calls it good. Everything he creates, from the stars, to the sun, to the trees and the water, to the planets, to living things, he calls good. He affirms the goodness of all that he has created. And then on the seventh day, it says that he rests from his creation. He marvels at what was made as good. And he places in the garden the very first people, Adam and Eve. It's interesting that he places them in a garden as well, marveling on the seventh day of all that he has created, including his prized possession, which is his people. And this resonates with me because I love working on a garden or a yard and just sitting back after you trim the the bushes and you cut the grass and you just marvel at the beauty after you have tended to it. Maybe you feel the same with plants, house plants, and just sit back and you sit on your balcony or in your room and you just marvel at the beauty of tending to a garden. And this is what God did in the very beginning. We see his love working in creation. And it's something that we're to see the goodness of creation, and we as his people are meant to enjoy it. See, we are meant to enjoy God's creation. It's no accident that going to the beach early in the morning, as long as you get some coffee and you can wake up, and sitting there when it's dark and watching the sunrise is a powerfully emotional experience. It's no accident that when you go up on the top of a mountaintop and on a clear day overlook other mountain ranges in the distance that it does something to your soul. It stirs you. It's no accident that looking out and seeing a lunar eclipse or a blood moon is exciting. Or when you see a shooting star. You see, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, tells us this. The very beginning of this letter, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome. 
He says, for his invisible attributes, this is speaking about God, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. In creation that we are meant to enjoy, we see God's nature, his attributes, his goodness, his love. We are meant to enjoy his creation so that we might see the very nature of God. You see, enjoying God's creation refreshes our soul and reveals to us who God is, how vast and how powerful and how creative and how good, how compassionate, how intelligent he is. Therefore, as we consider the goodness of creation that God has deemed himself good, and we see God's love working in creation, and we know that we as his people are meant to enjoy it. In fact, it's just a privilege for us to enjoy his creation. The question that we have to now begin to ask ourselves is what is our role in creation? Is it simply just to enjoy? How does our love work in creation that God himself has deemed good, that he has placed his attributes and nature within. And that's the question that we're going to be fleshing out here in our passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 23. Because what we're going to see is that we are meant to care for creation. We are not meant to exploit it. We are meant to care for it so that we might continue to enjoy it. And we know this too because at the very beginning of Scripture, in the book of Genesis, God gives the very first person, Adam, a charge. And Adam and Eve have this mandate that they are to subdue the earth and have dominion over the living things. Now, this is really interesting, and it's also very important to understand. To have dominion is to rule with power, is to exercise power over those that you are responsible for. And to subdue is to bring something into control, to control something, to tend to it so that it is ordered. And so Adam is told in the garden that you are to subdue the earth, and have dominion over the living things. To have dominion over the living things means to understand your rightful place. See, as human beings, we are to have dominion over the living things. We are to understand that we are not a parasite on this earth. We are rather the prized possession of God's creation. We are the only living thing that is made in the image of God. And we have been given the responsibility to have dominion, to exercise power and rule over the living things. But that responsibility is a weighty one. It is not one we are to take lightly because God's creation is good and we are meant to rule over it, to have dominion so that we might maintain harmony. That's important to understand that our responsibility and the power that we've been given as God's prized possession is to maintain harmony. We see that even in the garden when God brings the animals to Adam for him to name and to even seek companionship with. He's meant to live in harmony with the living things, even though he is not equal to or less than any of them. In fact, he is superior as the prized creation. That's what it means to have dominion, is to seek to maintain harmony among the living things that God has created and called good. And we are to subdue, which is to bring under control. You see, you know, a garden, if you don't exercise control, and if you don't tend to it, it will become a jungle. But God very clearly places people, the very first people, not in a jungle, but in a garden, 
And they are to subdue it. They are to tend to it. It takes intentionality and sacrifice and time. So that is also our command as well, to not only to rule with power so that we might maintain harmony among the living things, but that we also might subdue, exercise control so that we might maintain the beauty of this earth as you would a garden. You may be thinking, what does it mean for me to have dominion over the living things to maintain harmony? And what does it mean for me to subdue the earth, to exercise control and bring it into order? I, I, I don't really see my place in that. And I think this is because of a few things. One is that many of us have never thought like this before. We haven't developed an ethic for creation care. We haven't considered what good stewardship looks like. It just hasn't been a part of our theology. Some of us may look at Genesis and say, wait a second, God tells this to Adam before sin enters the equation. So now that sin has entered the equation, does that still apply? I mean, why should we really care? Does it really matter at all? And I think one of the, the struggles that maybe you feel, that I know that I felt, is that in the last century in particular, the, the church has had not had a clear and compelling ethic for how to care for creation. It has not been clear and it has not been compelling at all. And yet we live in a time where there are many people that do care for this physical world. They may not view it as creation, though we know it is in fact God's creation, but they care for the environment, often born out of a few reasons. Maybe it's a humanitarian urge. There's an ethic that is behind their care for the environment. It could be because of a political party affiliation, where it's the position that they're meant to hold. Or it could be because they have a self-preservation mindset. Whereas they look into the science and as they consider the way that things are going, they say, I want my kids and my grandkids to enjoy the same earth that I am enjoying today. But the question for us is, how are Christians meant to care for the earth? How do, we bring, how do we exercise dominion and how do we subdue? How do we live out that calling that God gives to Adam that did not end when sin entered the world? In fact, it just made it more difficult. Well, one of the things that we have to consider is that God is very interested in how we engage in his creation. He's very interested and how we engage in his creation. And we know that because in the book of Revelation, it's speaking about the day that Jesus returns, the judgment of God. And it says something shocking. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18 says this. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for the rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. It says that there will be a time for destroying, bringing judgment to the destroyers of the earth. You see, we, we see that there is a judgment for those that have run from God and ignored God and used power to exploit people and to harm people and destroy people. But also, there is judgment for those that look to exploit and destroy the earth itself. God is very interested in how we engage in his creation that he called good. We are called to have dominion, not to destroy. Stewardship, good stewardship of God's creation is a Christian virtue. It is a virtue, one that sadly I believe that we have lost 
for different reasons, but one that we must hold to again. We must remember again. And I think the reason that we've lost this virtue of being good stewards of God's creation is for two primary reasons. The first is a mistaken theology. A mistaken theology that it doesn't matter how you engage in the world, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what policies and positions you hold to, it doesn't matter because God is just gonna do away with this earth and he's just gonna bring a new one. He's gonna bring the new heavens and the new earth. It's like God was kind of coloring on a page of a coloring book and it's not good because of sin and corruption and evil and so God's just gonna flip the page and he's gonna start coloring an entire new story. And the earth as we know it is gone, obliterated. If that's true, then our passage tonight makes no sense. The Apostle Paul writes this in verse 19 through 21. As we, he writes about considering your future glory. Listen to what he says in in verse 19 through 21. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The Apostle Paul says that the creation itself, the physical world and all that is within it, is it is yearning for its liberation, for its redemption, from its release, from the brokenness and decay that it has been subjected to, not by its own choice, but because of our choice to sin. Because of our choice to sin, the creation itself has been subjected to brokenness and decay, and it is yearning for its redemption. It says here, it's, it's just eagerly awaiting for God's plan to gather all of his people and to redeem his people. It is eagerly awaiting the day that Jesus returns so that it might be made new. And this is a consistent theme all throughout Scripture. Back in the Old Testament, God floods the earth. There's this great flood, and there's a promise given to Noah, a covenant that God makes with Noah. He says, I will never again flood the earth. And the rainbow is the sign of God's promise that he will never destroy the earth. So what's God going to do? Well, 2 Peter chapter 3 says that the earth is being kept for fire, which is, marked in scripture time and time again as a purifying element. That the earth is being kept for purification. Just as we read here that it is yearning to be released. It is yearning to be purified of the brokenness and decay that it's been subjected to. And that is this earth here. Not one that will be made separately But this one here, in fact, Jesus in the book of Revelation at the very end says, Behold, I am making all things new. All things new. Not just us, his prized creation, but all of creation is being made new. What does that mean to be made new? It doesn't mean that God's going to obliterate and start over. It means he's going to redeem. You see, what God creates, he doesn't destroy, he redeems. What God creates and calls good, he doesn't destroy, he redeems. He does not destroy us as he is in the process of making us new. We are made right with God through faith in Christ, but we are being made new into that new creation. The same is true of the physical world. He does not destroy it. He is redeeming it and making it new. Creation, though finite, is on a path to to be infinite, eternal, 
as God is making it new. And it is yearning for its redemption. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we see that the ultimate place where God will liberate creation from its brokenness is in the new heavens and new earth. And it is, in fact, a garden city where God's people will enjoy his physical creation as we were meant to in the very beginning when he sat back on the seventh day and marveled at his creation and called it good. That is his plan. You see, our faith, our faith as followers of Christ is in Christ the creator who embodied his creation. This is how you know that God cares about this physical world. It's how you know that it is important for you to consider how you are to engage in this physical world. It is how you know that God has a plan for this physical world that stretches into eternity. Because Christ himself, who is the creator, as we read in John chapter 1, through him all things were made. Christ the creator embodied his creation by being made flesh. By coming here and being a part of this physical world. So that he might instill and install the plan of redemption for us and for our souls. But also for all of creation as he has promised to make all things new. You see, the incarnation, the incarnation speaks of the importance of our physical world. It reveals to us that God cares. That he's not just going to obliterate it and do away with it. He cares about it and he has a plan of redemption for it. It's one reason why I think many Christians have failed to hold to the virtue of caring for creation and being good stewards. And the second one is political agendas. Unfortunately, most of the terms that are used to speak about caring for the environment, caring for the physical world, have been politicized. And a lot of people speak about their opinions and their thoughts on the science or on the earth and what we should do and we should not do without without knowledge. A lot of people speak without knowledge because their political party has told them the position that they're supposed to hold. They don't know why, but they believe that that is the right position. And there's a lot of different reasons that people may speak and they hold to it. As I said, it could be their political party. There could be a genuine care for the earth. There could be corporate or individual gain and greed that's associated with the positions that people have. But St. Augustine said something hundreds of years ago to Christians about science and how we engage with science. He said, I want you to imagine that somebody comes up to you and they start talking to you about the Bible and about faith in Jesus. And you can tell they know very little. And as they start sharing with you and maybe a few other people around you about the Bible and about Jesus, it's very clear that they are misrepresenting the text, that they are not right. In fact, what they're saying is blasphemous but they're asserting themselves as if they know what they're talking about. St. Augustine says, you may say something and address it, but most likely you will never want to speak with that person on any other topic again. Conversely, if you speak about matters that you know little about or you haven't done the research, and you're speaking to somebody that knows a lot about that topic, and they, t- they can tell that you're misrepresenting the facts, or there are other motivating factors that are leading you to certain positions, how do you think they will engage with you on other topics? Will they listen to you when you want to speak about the resurrection of the dead? When you want to speak about eternal life? Probably not. Because they feel as if they cannot trust what you say. First Peter chapter three, verse 15 tells us that we are to be prepared to give a reason 
for the hope that is within us. And I really believe that having a proper understanding of God's love for his creation and our involvement in it and seeking to be good stewards and to care for his creation well that is not motivated by politics at all but is simply motivated by our faith because we see goodness in creation we see God's plan for creation and we know that we are to be involved in it and God is interested in the way that we engage it that that stance without assuming knowledge and speaking on things we know little about, but seeking to learn and to listen, would may be extremely evangelistic in our day and age. I think there are so many people that could never, that can't fathom a person of faith seeking to learn about the environment, care for the environment, seek to understand and, and be good stewards of what they can control and what they champion, not because of a political party, but because of their faith. And maybe that would be a catalyst for somebody to hear about the resurrection of the dead, the death of a Savior on a cross for their sins. I really do believe that there is power in that that we as Christians are to engage science and scripture rightly because what we believe is that God created everything out of nothing and that the universe itself is not self-starting, it is not self-sustaining, nor is it self-explanatory. It is God who is holding all things together. It depends upon him. And when we look into it and when we listen and when we engage, we actually find God himself. One of the most famous scientists of all time who was so curious about God's creation that it led to him making some of the greatest discoveries in the history of the world speaks about this reality of of the God behind all of the physical world. His name's Albert Einstein. He says this, My religion consists of a humble admiration of the illimitable superior spirit who reveals himself in the slight details we are able to perceive with our frail and feeble minds. That deeply emotional conviction of the presence of a superior reasoning power which is revealed in the incomprehensible universe, forms my idea of God. You see, science is sacred space. It's sacred space. But because behind every system and every star and every sequence is God himself, the creator and the author of all of these things. In fact, surveys would show, contrary to popular belief, that 40% of all scientists believe in a personal God. Because when you look into God's creation, when you seek to engage God's creation, when you care about God's creation, you see God himself. And we are meant to engage in that church. And you don't have to be a scientist to understand something that's very basic. When you get your theology right and you leave politics aside and you just say, God, how am I supposed to think about your creation? There's a basic truth that we all know and you don't have to be learned and studied in the scientific disciplines. And that is this. If you don't care for something, it will break. If you don't care for something, it will break. If you don't put oil in your car, it will break. If you don't change your your filter in your AC, it will break. Some of you are thinking, when's the last time I changed the filter in my AC? You're going to go and change it immediately. If you engage in certain lifestyles in your life and habits in your life that are not healthy, you will break if you don't care for yourself. And if we don't care for God's creation, it will break. It will continue to decay and to break. And we know this because verse 22, as we read, it says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It is yearning and groaning for its redemption, for its liberation from this decay and this broken state that it finds itself in. 
You see, why would we doubt that there would be negative effects on God's creation and on the world because of a lack of care or decisions that are influenced by pride or personal gain? So we need to consider how we are to love creation because God calls it good and he has a plan for it. Because we are called to have dominion and to subdue. And then lastly, because we are called to care for the poor. We're called to care for the poor. You see, the positions we hold, the policies we champion, and the personal decisions that we make regarding the physical world, they affect and many times severely affect the poor. They disproportionately affect the poor. We have the privilege of living in a very wealthy nation where we will feel the effects of a lack of care for the physical world and the environment later than other people. And many are feeling it now. To give you an example of that on a, non, a very non-controversial issue, which is pollution. Pollution equals bad. I think we all know that. It can't be good. 3.8 million people die every year from air pollution. Disproportionately affects the poor. That is three times the amount of people that die from HIV and AIDS. 50% of all premature deaths of children under five is due to air pollution. Listen to this, water pollution. Water pollution, not clean and safe drinking water has more deaths attributed to it than any form of violence, including war, in the entire world combined. It's shocking. It disproportionately affects the poor, and Jesus tells us that we, as followers of him, followers of Christ, that a marker for us is that we are to care for the least of these. Matthew 25. We are to care for the least of these. Those that are not in the same type of situation, that are affected negatively and severely in ways that many of us cannot even imagine. We're to care for the least of these. In fact, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. There's a mandate given that for six years you're to work the fields and for the seventh year you're to rest. You're to allow the fields to rest and to replenish and not plow. And in that seventh year, you're to give the field to the wild animals, living in harmony, and to the poor. All the way back in the Old Testament, God is seeking to, to create an ethic around care for the poor and care for the earth. That those things are in fact intertwined and to create a rhythm in your life so that you will not exploit the earth or people, especially the poor. I was reading 1 John chapter 3 this week, and I, I never saw this connection before. I wanted to share it with you. It says this, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. If anyone sees his brothers or his sisters in need and closes his heart towards them, how does God's love reside in them? You see, brothers and sisters that are in need are not only those that are in immediate proximity to us. They are those that are in other countries and other places that are severely affected by things that we don't experience and we take for granted. And my prayer is that as we consider our engagement in the environment how we treat and view the physical world and as we seek to be good stewards of God's creation, that we would seek to live it out in word and deed, seeking to care for those that don't have the same resources or the world's goods, as John says. 
showing compassion and concern. You may be thinking, what can I do? You know, like I'm one person. How, I mean, I can't stop pollution. How can I have any effect on these things that are severely affecting the least of these? How am I supposed to seek to maintain the beauty of God's creation? And how do I exercise? I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. Well, I'll say this. One is that you should find hope. Find hope in the truth that God and his plan for his creation will not be thwarted by any person or any government or any policy or any position. He will bring it to its proper place and he will in fact redeem this earth and establish it as that beautiful garden city. But however, there is one thing that you are responsible for. There's one thing that I'm responsible for. And that's me. That's you. You are responsible for yourself. And so I want to suggest that there's one thing that you can do, and this is one thing that I have done this week, and that's to repent. To repent. Because repentance brings understanding. And what repentance means is to return to God and his word and his ways. God, what does your word say? Help me to see your word about how I'm to care for creation. How, what are your ways? How am I to balance your word rightly with the world that I live in? How might I engage? How might I care for the least of these? How might I live in word and deed? Turn back to God in repentance because we all have a tendency to place our agenda and our will on God's word instead of allowing it to speak to us. You see, the closing here of our passage in Romans chapter 8 is a verse that kind of feels like it doesn't fit, but it does. Verse 23, the apostle Paul says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. You see, when you seek to be a good steward of God's creation and you want to care for it well, you stand in the plan of God's redemption. You stand in the plan of God's redemption. The book of Colossians says that Christ created all things and in him all things hold together. In him all things hold together. The Apostle Paul says here that it's a reminder of the groaning of your own spirit, of your own soul for the redemption of your body and of your life. See, T.F. Torrance, the scholar and theologian, he says that creation has been inscribed with Christological coherence. Creation has been inscribed with Christological coherence, meaning that in everything and behind everything you see Christ, the one who holds all things together, the one who went to the cross to die for your sins so that you might stand firm in hope and the redemption of your body and for the future glory that awaits you in that garden city. But he also died so that this earth might be redeemed to be there with us. Because it was deemed good in the beginning too. Just as we are. We are his prized creation meant to enjoy the rest of his creation. And when we look into it, we see Christ himself, the one who created all things and holds all things together. And what it reminds us when we want to care for creation, we want to be good stewards, we want to listen, we want to learn, we want to humble ourselves. What it leads us to is to not only see God's love for his creation, but to see God's love for us. It should show you that God loves you. He loves you so much that he has an amazing plan for you. One that includes your redemption and one that includes the redemption of this earth that you get to enjoy forever with his people and with him. There is Christological coherence inscribed in creation. We should care about it, church. We should care about it. 
You see, creation care is sacred and it is spiritually formative. It forms your faith and it is sacred ground. Because Christ himself is the one that is holding all things together. I want to close by reading a prayer. I thought to myself, man, I, I don't really know like what step to take. You know, I, I try to do my part with recycling, but outside of that, what do I do? And I don't have all the answers. I have very little answers, to be honest. I'm just, see God's word. And I want to repent, and I want to listen, and I want to learn. And I want to grow as a good steward of creation. So I wrote a prayer. And if you have our, our app, you can find the notes for this sermon on there, and the prayer is written out at the very end. But I, and you could pray it yourself, and I encourage you to write your own. But this is a prayer that I'm praying for myself. So I want to close with it. I want to ask you to pray with me. We pray together. God, you love me. Your plan of redemption for me is secure and I long for it. Thank you for allowing me to stand in your plan of redemption for all things. I repent for my indifference and ignorance regarding wise stewardship of the earth. Give me your heart for creation and grant me simple and clear next steps. I lift up my brothers and sisters suffering now from pollution, disease, famine, deforestation, overfishing, and any other byproducts of environmental decay or exploitation. Give me wisdom. Give wisdom to leaders and companies capable of making a substantial difference. And show me how to love, not just in word, but deed. Lastly, God, grant me opportunities to speak about your love for this earth so that I might point people to the new earth being prepared for your people. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.